Welcome to Merv 2019 again. In this video, we're going to check out you know, what people are actually using their 3D printers for, because that's one of the big themes. 3D printers are still awesome, of course. I mean, we've got the, like, one of the biggest 3D printers ever behind me. But the thing is, at Maker Fairs and at the Midwest Repro Festival, people are actually putting them to use. They're doing awesome stuff with it. So we're going to check out some of the coolest projects that I've seen here that actually make use of 3D printers. But first, thank the Perusa Research for sponsoring my trip to Murph this year. Uh, their SL1 printer is gonna start shipping soon. And together with the CW1, it's gonna take the mess out of resin printing. Check it out at the link below. Let's go. Okay, Jason, if I look at this, this uh -huh. is this is 3D printed. This yes, first is. of all, it doesn't look 3D printed oh. because it's like it's so digital. Uh-huh. But also it's kind of ugly. Yes it is. <laughs> where, where are you taking this? So what I'm doing is this is just the first layer of five layers, and I'm using cyan, magenta, and yellow to uh, create colors, just like a, a copy machine. If you look at it, your, your, your toner colors are those three colors. So by having five layers of those, I can kind of have a rainbow of about 240 individual colors, even though I'm only using four colors as inputs. Right. And we're going to show some B-roll right here of what this looks in here in the light box because what we can see is it, it, you've got a bunch of colors that you right. can pick from, but by blending them and dithering them, I guess, I, I don't know what, what you do in, in the softest side of things, but it's actually a really nice image you, that you're getting. Right. So, so what I do is then I put a lithophane on top of it, and that what that does is it controls the brightness. So if it's a bright yellow or dark yellow, the lithophane thickness controls that. And then it also um, sort of, instead of getting that pixelated look, it kind of smooths it over so you're not seeing the kind of individual pixels like you do in the, in the bottom of the print. So you do color on this, and then you right. add the, the white on top to add the shading, the dark and bright. Yes. Exactly, yep. Um, and what software does that? I mean, I know software that does the litho paint on top, but the, the color, that, that's got to be something custom. Right, it, it is pretty much custom. I um, So what I do is I, I take the image, I put it into GIMP, and then I t turn that into the colors that I have. And then from there, I take the output, and I'm able to map that to the recipe of each color. And so it's a script, and, and actually the, uh, the lithophane that I have is 384,000 individual squares that have to be determined whether it's yellow, cyan, or magenta. And in the end, it, it's, it's rendered in OpenSCAD. So I do, uh, that's where I do get the actual STL files. Yeah. Yeah, but if, if you look at this, I mean, a pixel is, is how large? Just, just enough for like two perimeters, right? That's Actually, it's one perimeter. It's just one perimeter. So I have a 0.4 nozzle, and so it's a 0.8 square. So it's just one square. One, one squiggle there. Yeah. What machine can handle that? Because that, that's going to be crazy for retracts, and, and also it's five colors. So you're doing multicolor on each layer. How are you pulling that off? Um, for this, I'm using, I, I built a, one of the rail core kits. It's uh, That's it, this one right here? Yeah, it's right, right there. And um, and so it's a core XY, and it's a linear rail, and it has a auto bed level. So it it, 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 with, it has three um, Z axes, and then it levels it so I can do a 0 .08 first layer print, and it, 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 it nails it. Sweet, yeah, but I guess you, you do have to be consistent or the colors are going to be off. Yeah, it's going to be off, or if it's slightly under-extruded, then it isn't, it's going to mess up the light shining through it. Um, and I guess the, the scripts and stuff you've published somewhere so people can try this out for themselves? Um, I will be. It's just kind of a mess right now. So I, I just printed this a couple weeks ago, and with the birth preparations, it, I, I will get to it, I promise. It's just that I... It, it's not usable for anybody else yet. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the, the usual bane of, of open projects, of hobby projects. You design it for yourself, and then it takes you twice as long to clean it up, right? E exactly, exactly. Yeah. But really cool project, and, and thanks for sharing this off. Oh, thank you, Tom. James, you brought in the Cade. You had a small one last year, but uh, it grew. So this is... It's, this thing is completely 3D printed, right? Yeah, 100%. Uh, it's like 22 grams of material, 1,200 hours of printing, two CR10s working together, and... Uh, Started as a labor love, then ended up being like, you know, like brute headedness to just get it done. So, yeah. and 
I mean, everything from the control panel, of course, the buttons and stuff are, are regular arcade buttons that you, that you plop in there, to the stand, to the screen. Um, so this is a Raspberry Pi, right? Yeah, it's running uh, Raspberry Pi using RetroPie, which is like probably the most common retro gaming solution. Easiest to get set up and running. And uh, it's funny you mentioned the buttons. I had actually started 3D printing buttons, and it was like the first thing that got chopped when I started running low on time. But uh, it was actually surprisingly easy to print buttons that had 3D printed PTG uh, springs that gave a fairly, like, not the same satisfying click, but the same feel. So, yeah, But you got to stop somewhere, right? Uh, I don't know that that's true, but for now... Well, you, you, <laughs> you, you didn't, obviously, yeah. but... Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no. Yeah, well, one cool thing that, that he showed to me uh, just a second ago is that the screen can rotate. What's, what's the point in that? So a lot of the older games were uh, written to run in portrait versus landscape mode. So games like Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, 1943, that type of stuff. And I didn't want to have two cabinets, and I didn't want to have the black borders on the side. So I went, you know, it's easy enough since I'm designing it from scratch to put in some rollers on the bottom so it has something to roll on and uh, rotate the screen. So. Yeah. And originally that was supposed to be motorized, but time constraints, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping for Earth that it will be motorized. Very minimum, the red button will cause it to go between the two of them. But also looking at tying into the APIs, including MAME, to be, you know, just send a command out and do it. So. A lot of stuff you can do there. Um, what's with the with the aesthetic? Because th this doesn't look like a classic arcade, but it's also like not a modern thing. It's it's pretty empty. What what, what prompted you to do this specific look? Um, the original design looked very much like an old Pac-Man or Galaga-style cabinet, and I had been talking with Joel, 3D printing nerd, and uh, he had said, hey, you've done a really nice job with the aesthetics of it, but why don't you make it your own? So I started designing stuff. The base kind of was the first thing that was redesigned. For a while, it looked like this base with a regular old arcade sort of slapped on the top. Then I was like, well, I want the screen to rotate, so this became spherical and their, you know, cylinder um, base. And uh, it just evolved from there. I wanted something that when you looked at it, you're like, I couldn't just make that out of wood. Because if I could just make it out of wood, then people say, why didn't you just make it out of wood? Yeah, so. and the, the, the same, you mentioned, like, why don't you sand it down and, and remove all the layer lines? Like, it's 3D printed. Like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. own it. Oh, that's 100% it. I have done stuff in the past where it's like, I'm trying to recreate something that exists. In which case, yeah, you sand, you paint, or whatever. But the goal of this was never to be like, oh, it was ABS injected or any of that type of stuff. I just... I want people to look and go, that's a cool 3D printed arcade cabinet. Yeah. And you've got the coin slot down there, that is working, right? It is. Uh, I designed these maker coins specifically for Murph. And, I'm, uh, I'm going to forge those, so next time. <laughs> I actually released the design, like the size, you know, it's 50 millimeter by 6 millimeter will work. It's, the mechanism's simple, it's a micro switch with a slightly bent uh, lever on it so that it doesn't stop it from going in, but it's enough that it triggers it and has a little bit of flexibility to it. So. Yeah. Well, free games for everyone. Well, thanks for bringing it along, and thanks for letting people play with it, I guess. No, well, thanks for stopping by. I'm glad people have enjoyed it. Yeah. Awesome project. What is this? That is a PLA spring. Okay, and what is our 3 cord using this for? Ripcord is using that in our... Wait, that, it's a 3, man. Huh? It's a 3, it's not in the... We're, we're not doing that. <laughs> Rip 3... Rip... Rip the cord... <laughs> Get it right. <laughs> the cord is doing it with our our box. So we've got the rep box in the back here, and it's a filament management solution. And basically what we're trying to do with the spring is allow people to hook, like, the MMU2 up directly to the box without having to have a buffer zone. So what we did was we printed it out and designed. It's kind of based loosely off of the open source universal spool rewinder system. So it basically just spins while it's feeding filament to the unit, and as soon as the MMU needs to retract that filament back, it just brings it right back onto the spool. Yeah. So you don't get those huge loose droop loops. Exactly. So you, it removes the need to have the buffer box that Prusa is providing, and you can just have a completely contained filament path from box to the MMU too. Nice. Can people print these for themselves, or are you keeping that to yourself? No, this is absolutely 100% open source. Like I said, I borrowed a lot of the components. So, uh, you know, I'm a licensed fanatic, yeah. so it is available on Thingiverse right now. Uh, just rep rewind is what it's under. Is that with a three? That is not with a three. Okay. And But people can also buy that box with five filaments in there, perfect for the MME2. Correct. And the... Uh, the actual box will come with rollers, so you can put big fat spools in there. And uh, you, you've got upgrade options like a seal kit, a wall mounting kit, and a whole bunch of just great side panel options 
So, yeah, it's customizable. It's nice. Looking good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Marte, uh, you've brought maps, which is not something that, that usually people get excited about, but we, we've been talking. You're pretty much the only guy who has a really good map of Iceland. Yeah. How did that come about? Like this, uh, this is this is so nerdy, but it's it's good fun, right? Yeah, it came about in that way. I, I've been work, working as a volunteer in a search and rescue yeah. operation in Iceland, and using the maps that were available at the time. I was planning a route down a glacier, and what happened that I drove off a 70 meter cliff that was not on the map, so it was just vertical down, and I'm lucky to be alive. To be honest, and I would have killed my crew if if it would land it in the other way. And after that event, I was just I'm not gonna kill myself doing search and rescue. I have to f f find a better way. So I started to look around if there was available data from somebody that was not uh, doing it. Uh, searching with with the, the university mapping agency in Iceland and various sources, and found out there was so much more detailed maps, uh, uh, data available, raw data, and I've, it's all open source, free data, and and I got, gathered that together and created my own maps to. So, <laughs> so all the all the info was out there, but people just weren't using it, right? Yeah. Um, but this one is kind of interesting because you've got like, you mentioned you have like a six terabyte map file of the entire island, um, but you're also adding to it yourself. You're also creating more data for that. How, how do you go about that? Yeah, the, in, in the cases I get a request to do a very detailed map with extreme detail. I have a drone that I fly over with a software that takes a series of imagery. Using photogrammetry software, I combine these images into a 3D model and I can create a very detailed map up to 10 centimeter resolution. And, uh, so if I get requests for a certain area, I, I do that and, and then combine that data set into my complete data set. So, so I'm slowly building up areas. You get like really high detail maps of certain areas. By the way, Iceland is an island. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> just, just trying to make sure. Yeah, it's an island. Uh, uh, you could fit Iceland in the state of Kansas just to give people scale. Okay, I don't, I don't get scale for the US, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah maybe our viewers. <laughs> yeah, but it's not very big. You can drive coast to coast in 12 hours. There's a lot of mountain areas and highlands, so, and a lot of people traveling. We've got a lot of tourists coming over to Iceland, yeah. and having maps to navigate, it's crucial. Um, and uh, the thing in Iceland, though, you mentioned that, like you get a lot of tourists. It's a really scenic country. I've not been there, but uh, I've seen I've seen many good reviews of the yeah, country. Yeah, um, <laughs> and a, a big thing that that you Icelanders do is you have a, a whole search and rescue team that that needs these maps. That you know, if if somebody gets lost in the mountains or their car dies or whatever. Uh, you have a team that, that then rescues those people, and, and that, that's what you're doing that for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's uh, uh, like over 2,000 people in Iceland, all volunteers that yeah. come together with public funding uh, and volunteering work to get funding for equipment and such. And it's it's a lot of work, but having been in, I've been in it in more than 15 years, helping out, saving people, getting finding injured people, helping it out, getting them into safety. It's the best feeling in the world, and it uh, makes it all worthwhile. Absolutely. So I guess one one last question, because the photogrammetry, of course, that's that's what you guys probably are interested in, and then I'm kind of also yeah. uh, what what hooked me. Um, so you mentioned you have the, the Phantom 4 that you're flying around for this. Yeah. Um, what software are you using? Are you, are you just using Meshroom? No, I'm, I'm using for the controlling the drone. It's called Drone Deploy that controls the flight path. I take the imagery from the flight path and use Akisoft Photoscan. It's a commercial software that you, you can import the imagery into and it creates a very detailed uh, 3D like point cloud out of the data. And also, with it combines the imagery into one bitmap, so it corrects for for distance and and, and slopes in the landscape. And then I can I, I import that as a as a point cloud into my mapping software. Okay. So that that's a software. It's, it's a very specialized mapping uh, procedure with a mapping software as well. It's a it's not, and not it's not a free ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, it's a very specialized software. Yeah. It uses a ton of resources and. 
Yeah, we can see the results. You're getting what in the 10 centimeter range? Uh? Yeah, I can with a, with a drone imagery. And like in this one, there's a parking lot here, and there's actually bumps where my car is on the parking lot. It's, it's, you can see the car in, in this model, so it's extreme detail. But the thing with a drone, it's limited on in how many kilometers per kilometer area I can do at a time. It's flying it's, uh, for 25 minutes on a battery covers the area, and if I have to do a bigger area, I have to change battery and fly again and fly again and it's it's uh, it's uh, yeah it's not it doesn't scale up to many many tens of so kilometers yeah and and it's a worthwhile cause i mean it's it's good seeing people doing this and actually you know saving people's lives literally yeah. uh thanks for your time good talking yeah. to you yeah thank you so the fist bump all right yeah. <laughs> look guys i found somebody who makes actual 3d printed speakers here at murph uh what, what are you showing off these are these are a bit more involved than, than what I've done on my channel so far. So um, I'm I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm Tangential Studios. Orthographic Audio is the speaker brand. Uh, the line that you, that we're seeing today is elevation. I've got uh, studio monitors and then a concept for a desktop version as well. Uh, everything's printed in protopasta using carbon fiber. The small ones are variations on HTPLA, including some custom variants that I made at the workshop. So following some footsteps of uh, some of the community. Uh, uh, it's, been a, it's, it's been a concept project for the last few years, and it's in the last year since last year at MRF. Um, formed a business around it, ultimately looking to build a mentoring company because there's a lot of intersectionality in 3D printing and looking to build a business conceptually to embrace a lot of those things. So you're basically just using 3D printing as a tool. You're actually making things with them. That, that's awesome. So this is going to be a product that people can buy, right? Eventually, later this year, I'm uh, in parentheses, almost ready to launch is... Uh, uh, I'm describing it right now. Uh, later this year, TBD, um, hoping to launch a, a uh, concept customer program later this spring for pre-production units on the, on the larger monitors, uh, building in some exclusivity for some, some uh, hi-fi customers. Uh, later on, uh, the, the smaller ones might lend better to a kit uh, doing some things similar to what what you're looking at from an experience. Yeah, well, what, what, what do you think about that one? The, the modular spe speaker concept is it as bad as people say? I from as an you you hesitated. Okay. No, no, not hesitant. But with an educator hat on, I teach an audio production class outside of my 3D printing work, and uh, I'm also looking at doing some things with the smaller things, not. Not quite as much with the enclosures. That's kind of a set thing for me. But um, with the small concepts to, uh, that I'm showing uh, this weekend, are more about the crossover design and some of the electronics. And those are the, a lot of the things that I've learned about coming from more of an art background into this, where I've learned a lot about engineering in the process. And that and those are the cool things about that that excite me about 3D printing. If you come in with a creative background, you're going to learn some technical things. Or if you come in technical, you're going to learn creative things to see your vision come to reality. And I gotta say, these are some cool looking speakers. I've, I've not really had a chance to listen to them because like it's, it's pretty noisy out here. But yeah, from, from what, I've, what I was able to pick up, they seem to be pretty well performing speakers in their own right, right? Yeah. Um, don't have any measurements on my the the new pre-production candidates, but um, looking at getting into uh, right at about 60 hertz, just below for uh, the previous prototypes. So I'm expecting to perform similarly with the uh, the new ones, um, and shooting to hit uh, below 100 hertz for a desktop speaker on the small ones. So those are some goals. I have some other things in mind, kind of, uh, I've been describing it as like a, almost like an eight-way malfunction junction intersection of efficiency all at the same time. I know it's a little bit counterproductive in a description, but material use, print times, overall cost, uh, looking at trying to optimize something for somebody on a smaller one to bring an accessible kit into that also allows the experimentation. And that's kind of where we're kind of talking about.
Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, thanks for coming by to Murph and uh, showing off your speakers. We were talking last year, and it looks like you've made some really nice progress. All right, thank you, man. Thanks for coming by. I appreciate speaking with you. Right on, man.